So, so tell us first of all, just briefly, if you may, what, what is so new and groundbreaking about this, uh, this treatment, this development? Right. So this is the first systemic administration of CRISPR where we actually infused it into the body and inactivated a disease-causing gene in a very, very targeted fashion. And what's particularly exciting about that is that we were able to essentially completely inactivate that gene and see that in the clinical effects of these patients. So uh, a major advance in the gene editing space. To, to what extent can this be applied to other diseases as well? Is it very broad or, or quite targeted in terms of what it can be used for? Well, I think CRISPR itself can be broadly applied. The challenge is getting it to those uh, particular uh, genes that cause disease. So we started in the liver, um, which is uh, an area where there are many problems with disease-causing genes, and we've shown that we can reach that uh, very, very successfully. There's other tissues after that that we're pursuing, especially the bone marrow, uh, where a, a long list of, of blood-borne type diseases uh, can be addressed. And then after that, there's a lot of work going after uh, uh, defective genes and other tissues. Uh, can you target some of the most common diseases and causes of death, heart disease, diabetes, cancer? Some of those diseases are monogenic, meaning they're caused by one particular gene. And I would say where we are right now, uh, this sort of approach will be uh, very, very successful uh, if we can reach them in, in the respective tissues. Other conditions that are uh, polygenic, that have many different factors that relate to that, are going to be more difficult to tackle. What are the dangers uh, of this approach, John? I mean, gene editing sounds, sounds fabulous when it works. Is it particularly bad if it doesn't work? Are the side effects much worse than, than regular treatments? Well, I think one of the uh, real breakthroughs here is we've been able to demonstrate incredible uh, uh, specificity, which means we can target that one gene that causes the problem and inactivate it. So in many respects, I think people are excited that we've de-risk a lot of the questions that uh, uh, have uh, initially uh, applied to the field. So generally speaking, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm that this will be able to be applied uh, safely. It's very exciting, John, and you can see it in the stock price and, and just reading about this, this kind of development could be a revolution, but, but it's just phase one. So basic proof of principle, of concept, how long will it take and what are the next steps to get it to market and actually get it into use, to put it to use? Yeah, no, I, I think it's an important point and I appreciate that you uh, noted that. I mean, this are phase one results. That's the initial use in humans. Uh, these approaches are subjected to the standard sorts of uh, clinical trials that any drug uh, or gene therapy would be studied under. And so we're in the earlier stages of that. Uh, over the next uh, a very few years, we would expect this would be, uh, uh, you know, subjected to those standard sorts of tests. But our uh, hope is that this will be available to patients uh, very, very soon. And what we learned from this initial trial uh, will be uh, principles that we can apply to a whole raft of other indications. On, on that point, and to Sarah's earlier question, I, I had read that uh, inherited heart conditions uh, could be a, a very clear target for this. Is that right? It depends on the particular condition. I, I think people are very interested in pursuing certain risk factors uh, that affect uh, lipid metabolism, cholesterol, and things like that, where we know there's a strong genetic link. Uh, modifying those genes or inactivating those, uh, I think most people expect would confer significant benefit on patients. I understand it's pretty expensive, John. What, what is the cost of doing this, and does that serve as a barrier to, to making this more of a widespread treatment, at least initially? Well, we've certainly not priced it yet, and it's early stages here. In fact, we believe that over time this is going to be very uh, uh, valuable for patients and probably resource sparing for the healthcare system overall. Um, it really comes down to some of the advantages with single application where literally it's a one and done uh, uh, therapy for uh, most indications that we imagine. So that uh, we expect over time uh, will be generally very, very favorable in, in the economics of this uh, entire field. What, what is the actual overlap, John, with the technology that's been used in COVID vaccines, Moderna and, and Pfizer COVID vaccines? Yeah, it's a really important question because there's similarities, but there are very, very key differences as well. Where the overlap uh, applies is uh, on the delivery, where lipid nanoparticles, that's the actual structure that carries you know, the cargo into patients, is very similar. 
uh, in the cargo in both cases is a form of RNA known as messenger RNA. The difference is what those mRNAs encode. So in the case of the COVID vaccine, you make a little piece of the virus that the body responds to and you raise an antibody to that very, very effectively. In the case of CRISPR, what we're doing is creating the gene editor uh, inside a cell at that point, so it will actually alter the disease-causing gene. So a lot of similarities, but the final common pathway uh, is quite different. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.